Uh, my name is Debbie Miller, and I have a story to tell you. Uh, I'm here to educate some of you and to enlighten all of you about what reckless canning looks like. And I bowed while I was in intensive care, paralyzed and on a ventilator, uh, to tell my story as often as I could in hopes that others would realize the seriousness of proper canning uh, to their safety and the safety of their families. I had prepared jams and water baths, uh, but I had never pressure canned vegetables. My Presto pressure canner was large. I have it here. Uh, I had raw packed six to eight one and a half pint uh, glass jars in a pressure canner that I had been given to by a neighbor. Uh, it was a well-made Presto pressure canner, but there were no instructions uh, for its use. That was my first mistake. I had no idea how to use this Presto pressure canner. No idea. I did not uh, have the gauge checked out and properly calibrated by the USU food extension team. I basically ignored their recommendation. I figured that I could just cook the beans longer and that would uh, destroy any risky bacteria. But finally the day can came to can. I bought kosher salt, I washed my beans, uh, I cut my beans and began packing them. I was so excited. And since I was working with my neighbor who had done some canning, I surely wouldn't make any stupid mistakes. Well, just recently, about a year after my near fatal illness, um, I watched a YouTube video produced by the University of Alaska food safety personnel. Uh, the instructor said to fill the pressure canner with uh, three to four inches of water. As I heard her say this and watched her fill her pressure canner, I was alarmed to realize that out the gate I had failed to follow appropriate standards. What did I do in September of 2018? I filled my pressure canner to cover the one and a half pint glass jars of raw packed green beans. I had done that for jams in a water bath, so I guess I would do that for my canned green beans. I knew nothing about the difference between high acid foods like fruits and jams and sugary, you know, bread and butter pickles perhaps, and low acid foods like straight vegetables. I knew nothing about pH levels. All of these things I, I learned too late. I put too much water in the pressure canner. I filled it to the top of the one and a half pint glass jars. By filling my pressure canner with water, it would have never reached the appropriate temperature to kill the botulism. There was no room for the pressure to reach 240 degrees, nor was there room to create the required steam. Also, there was no weight on the vent pipe, which if it were properly placed, would have allowed the pressure canner to build up the pressure. And we'll get to the vent pipe in a minute. So I locked the pressure canner and I had no idea what to do next. I didn't consult the dial gauge because well, it didn't work. It remained at zero. I never got steam out of the vent port, nor did I look for steam to come out of the vent port. I did not even know what that thing was sticking up from the lid of the pressure canner. I just turned off the flame after five to six hours. I never reached the level of pressure to allow the vent port to release steam for 10 minutes as would have been industry standard. Like I said, I didn't even know what a vent port was, nor what it was used for. Then there was this metal thing about the size of dice. What was that for? Heck if I knew. It was the dead weight that was to be placed on the vent port after 10 minutes. But I hadn't read the instructions, so I didn't know anything about, about a vent port or a dead weight. After I turned off the gas burner, I think I did leave the pressure canner cool. I did let the pressure canner cool for a couple of hours, and I believe at about midnight I opened it. I don't remember if I took the green bean jars out of the water then or waited until the next morning to take them out. When I went to the kitchen the next morning, I checked the canned green bean lids after I had taken them out of the, can, the pressure canner. Okay, get ready. 
This is worthy of a shocked hand gesture. As I ran my finger across the top of the lids, some were concave and others were not. So I pressed down on those that weren't and applied pressure. And suddenly they were concave. There was evidence of improper sealing that I ignored. And I even altered and told myself they were properly sealed. The canned green beans stayed on the kitchen counter for a week or so, and I was so proud. Here I was, living the life in Utah, canning just like my grandma, these beautiful jars of green beans adorning my countertop. In about November, I pulled out a jar of my canned green beans and served them for dinner. I don't recall whether I boiled them in water or simply microwaved them, but we enjoyed them with no ill effect. In January, I finished the jar of green beans. I ate them on January 1st and on January 2nd. On January 4th, I woke up with double vision. Something was seriously wrong. I went to the emergency room at Salt Lake City Regional Medical Center as I was in Salt Lake at the time. There was no explaining it. I was rushed in to have a brain MRI to rule out a stroke. The MRI came back clear. I was sent home and told to call in if my condition worsened. The next morning I woke, with, woke up with a swollen tongue and continued double vision. I could barely hold my head up. The emergency room doctor had actually called me the second morning. I answered and it said almost inaudibly, my tongue is swollen. I need to come back. He said, come back in. I was again admitted and he asked me, what have you eaten? Like a ton of bricks, it hit me. I had eaten canned green beans that I had canned. I had botulism. He immediately got on the phone to the CDC. Blood samples for serum testing were taken. I laid back in that bed in the emergency room and literally watched and listened as the team determined a diagnosis of botulism. Everything was in full swing, and within 10 hours, the antitoxin was flown in from California and administered to me, all coordinated by my emergency room doctor and the CDC. I went from the emergency room to ICU later that morning, I believe, but time was beginning to stand still. I was sedated and I fell asleep. When I woke, it was daytime. Arm restraints were being applied because I had been intubated. I could no longer breathe on my own. I could not move any part of my body aside from my hands. And I had a nasal feeding tube inserted into my nose to my stomach. I would be in the ICU for nine more days and move to South Davis Community Hospital for 82 days of recovery, including rehab, included physical, occupational, and speech therapy. I had to be trached. I did not eat or drink for two months and had to learn how to drink, eat, and swallow again, not to mention to be weaned from a ventilator and be able to breathe on my own again. Lessons learned. Do a dry run before actually canning low acid vegetables. Find an instruction manual for your pressure canner. They exist online. It would not be that hard to find one. Read your instructions. Watch videos from universities on proper canning techniques. Learn about all of the components of your pressure canner. Assure that each can is properly sealed. No pressing down on those that aren't concave. But the final thing I focused on was telling my story and thinking of venues that I would use to tell it. And when I returned home, I did call uh, Charlie McCollum, the editor of the Herald Journal, and I pitched my story. I said, Charlie, there is a story here. California transplant comes to Utah, going to live a prairie life, start canning food and living off the land. And I almost killed myself trying to do it. I hope my story enlightens all of you on how at risk us urban dwellers are who come to these wonderful agricultural regions thinking we can just jump into canning. And if I can be a poster child for what not to do in canning, I'm happy to step up and help wherever I can. Thank you.